Welcome to Generative AI Futures. Today we are diving deep into an architecture that a lot of researchers and, I mean, some of the biggest names out there think is the future of truly intelligent AI. We're talking about a framework where models learn by, well, just observing and understanding the world, not by painstakingly reconstructing every single tiny detail. Exactly. We're talking about Joint Embedding Predictive Architectures, or JPA. And this is a really critical pivot point in model design. It's a move away from that pixel perfect generation towards capturing the, you know, the predictable dynamics of the world in a more abstract mathematical space. And we're going to track that progression today, starting with the original iJPA for images, then VGPA2 for video and robotics, and finally the latest VLJPA, which bridges this whole framework with language. Mm -hmm. So our mission is to really understand how these models achieve something pretty remarkable, learning to understand the world by simply watching it. A bit like how humans and animals do. That's the goal. We're going to unpack the architecture, the training mechanics, and the honestly surprising speed and effectiveness they show in the real world, especially for things like zero-shot robot planning. And the core approach here, which you know has been championed by researchers like Jan LeCun at FAIR, is built on this one powerful premise. Which is? If we can teach an AI to build a reliable internal world model just through passive observation, it becomes vastly more efficient, scalable, and capable of genuine generalization. Okay, let's unpack that core conceptual shift, because mm -hmm. this really is the philosophical starting line for JPA, and it makes it so different from the big generative models we always hear about. What is the big advantage of predicting these um, abstract, learned representations instead of just generating the raw output, the pixels or the text. It's all about focusing on the signal and crucially ignoring the noise. I mean, if you look at traditional generative models. Like diffusion models. Right, latent diffusion models or even pixel level prediction models like Cosmos. They are forced to model everything. Because they generate the raw output, they have to account for every single pixel, every token in a sequence. So if I ask a model to predict a ball rolling across a table, it's not just predicting the ball's path, it's predicting the exact flicker of light on the table surface. Exactly that. Or the analogy from the sources is perfect. You're in a field. A generative model has to predict the precise random location of every single blade of grass. Wow. Or the exact shimmer on a leaf from a gust of wind. That detail is fundamentally unpredictable and almost always irrelevant to the task. It's just noise that wastes computational cycles. That just sounds so wasteful. Why spend a billion parameters modeling randomness? Precisely. And that's what Vijapay's philosophy solves. It's a joint embedding approach where the model learns representations only for the predictable parts of a scene. Like the ball's trajectory. The ball's trajectory, the identity of objects, the main motion. And the architecture is explicitly designed to let it ignore those unpredictable high frequency details. It just makes the whole learning objective so much simpler, so much more stable. And that's what makes scaling possible. So if the model is learning to ignore those noisy details, mm. is there a risk it throws away something useful? I mean, are there cases where not having that pixel level detail actually hurts it? That's a good question. And the answer is generally no, because the objective isn't to reproduce the image. It's to create a representation that's useful for our downstream task, like classification or, as we'll see, planning. The JP encoder is trained to capture the predictable high-level dynamics, the world structure, really. So it learns a representation space that generalizes beautifully. The performance on benchmarks like something something v2 just confirms it. It captures motion better than models specifically trained with language. Okay, that brings us to the mechanics. How does it actually implement this ignore the noise philosophy? VGPay2 uses this mask denoising feature prediction objective. I know the math here is pretty key. It is. The whole idea is to predict the learned representation of a masked out piece of video, which we can call a way from the part that's visible. Let's call that X. You're forcing the model to infer the missing high level structure, not just fill in the blanks with low level details. So it's minimizing the L1 distance between its prediction and the real target representation. I'm looking at the equation here and I see this specific term LRG. At the other way. Mm -hmm. Elta Adechi is the stop gradient. What is that preventing? Ah, yeah, the stop gradient is the absolute linchpin. It prevents what's called representation collapse, which is a huge headache in self supervised learning. Okay. So the loss is minimizing the distance between the predictor's output and that HD term. 
By applying the stop gradient to the target encoder, we stop the gradients from flowing back into it. This means the main encoder can't learn a trivial solution. A trivial solution like what? Like just outputting a constant zero or some garbage vector that's super easy for the predictor to match. The stop gradient forces the predictor to chase a fixed rich target representation. That's what drives the genuine semantic learning. Brilliant. And the loss is only on the masked patches, mm -hmm. forcing that inference. Okay, so structurally, both the encoder and the predictor are based on vision transformers. But scaling VJBA2 up to a billion parameters needed uh, an architectural tweak, right? This 3D ropey thing. This is a huge but subtle technical breakthrough. Mm. Your standard absolute positional embeddings. When you're dealing with long video sequences, they just start to cause catastrophic problems. The model basically loses track of where things are in space and time. It's like trying to navigate a map where the coordinates start to wobble the further you walk. Exactly. 3D rope extends the standard 1D rotary position embedding by um, partitioning the feature dimension of the embedding into three parts. Mm -hmm. Temporal, height, and width. Mm -hmm. And it applies 1D rotations to each of those segments separately. This makes the training incredibly stable for the huge models, like the VITG encoder with its billion parameters. The model now has this robust relative sense of position across both space and time. Speaking of that VITG encoder, that brings us to the four key ingredients that made VJP2 so successful. Model scaling was one of them, right? Scaling from 300 million to a billion parameters? Yes, and this just emphasizes the JPEG philosophy again. The encoder, which creates the world representation, is this massive billion parameter thing. But the predictor network, the part doing the inference, was kept fixed at a tiny 22 million parameters. All the heavy lifting is in perception, not prediction. You got it. And the other keys were, well, just sheer volume of data and training time. Right, the four scaling ingredients. Correct. So first, data scaling up from 2 million to 22 million videos, a huge mix of video and even static images that they treated as short clips. Second, the model scaling we just mentioned. And third, longer training. They just let it run much longer, 252,000 iterations to really bake in that world knowledge. And the fourth ingredient is my favorite because it solves this like impossible computational problem. Training a VITG model on high-res video clips that could take 60 GPU years. How did they afford that? With something really clever. Higher resolution progressive training. Instead of training on the full resolution from day one, which would be incredibly expensive, right. they started at a lower, more manageable resolution. Say 16 frames at 256 by 256 during the training warm-up. Then, only in the final cooldown phase, they ramped up the resolution and clip length to the full target. Wait, only at the very end? Yes, and this smart progressive strategy gave them an astonishing efficiency gain up to an 8.4x speed up in GPU time compared to training that giant model at full resolution from the start. An 8.4x speed up. Mm. It's like painting. You block out the broad rough shapes first and only apply the expensive fine details right at the end. That's massive. That completely changes the economics of training these models and the results speak for themselves. 77.3% top one accuracy on something something V2. That's state-of-the-art for understanding complex human motion. Absolutely. The self-supervised representations are incredibly robust. But this brings us to the next big question. We've established VJ Patu is amazing at passively watching the world. How do you go from observation to action? Exactly. How do you bridge that gap to actually doing things in the physical world? Which brings us to VJ Patu 2AC, the action-conditioned world model for robotics. Right. This is where the world model gets deployed for real-time control. The first thing they do is take that highly trained VJP2 visual encoder and they freeze it. It's now the robot's pre-trained visual cortex. And then they train a new predictor on top of it. A new, separate, 300 million parameter predictor. This one uses a block causal attention mechanism, which is just a fancy way of saying it's forced to only predict forward in time. And what information is this predictor using to imagine the future? It gets an interleaved sequence of three things, the current encoded frame, the XK, then the robot's actual state, so like its seven-dimensional end effector position, SCAIC, and finally the action vector, XA, that the robot is about to take. And it learns to predict the next frame's representation based on all that. Yep, it learns to predict ZEC plus one. And what's remarkable is that this is trained on only about 62 hours of unlabeled robot video, a tiny amount compared to the 22 million videos for the encoder. They use two loss functions here. Okay, what are they? First is the standard teacher forcing loss. That just predicts the next step based on the ground truth sequence. 
But the really crucial addition for robotics is the rollout loss. Why do they need the rollout loss if they already have teacher forcing? Because teacher forcing always shows the model a perfect ground truth world. When it's time to actually plan an action, what we call a rollout, the model has to feed its own predictions back in as input for the next step. And if it makes a small mistake, that mistake compounds. It can accumulate exponentially and lead to total catastrophe. The model needs to practice dealing with its own imperfections. It needs to practice with its own mistakes. Precisely. The rollout loss forces the model to predict two steps ahead, using its own prediction for step one as the input for step two. Then it compares the final result to the ground truth. This makes the model way more robust during those long rollouts at inference time, which is essential for what's called model predictive control. MPC. Okay. Right. So once it's trained, the robot uses this model predictive control powered by energy minimization to pick its actions. It's searching for a sequence of actions that minimizes a goal conditioned energy function. And that energy function is beautifully simple here. It's just the L1 distance between the world model's imagined future state and the encoded goal representation. It's looking for the actions that make its imagined future look the most like the goal image. And because this is all happening in that abstract representation space, the computational gains for zero-shot planning are just staggering. Staggering is the right word. VGPay2AC pulled off successful zero-shot manipulation, like pick and place, with an 80% success rate in new environments. But the speed comparison, that's the real story. The one with the Cosmos baseline. Yes. Planning a single action with VGPay2AC took 16 seconds. Cosmos, which has to generate all the pixels of the future, took four minutes per action. Wait, 16 seconds versus four minutes? That's nearly 15 times faster? Yeah. That's the difference between a functional real-time robot and a slow lab experiment. Mm. The efficiency you gain by ignoring pixels is just enormous. It proves that this abstract space is the right place for high-speed real-time control. It changes everything. Okay, so now let's get to the newest evolution, VLGPPay. This brings language into the mix. But VDP2's visual decoder is already so powerful. Why even introduce language alignment for something like video question answering? Because the visual encoder is fantastic at spatiotemporal dynamics, but to answer complex questions about those dynamics, you need semantic alignment with human language. And here again, VLJPA avoids the classic mistakes of traditional generative vision language models. Which would be being forced to model all the task irrelevant linguistic features. Exactly. Style, phrasing, paraphrase. A traditional VLM has to generate the raw text tokens, so it has to perfectly model every grammatical quirk. VLJPA, instead, predicts the abstract semantic representation in the embedding space of the answer, not the literal words. This has to be huge for handling ambiguity. It's critical. Think about a light switch. The question is, what happens next? Two correct answers might be, the lamp is turned off and the room will go dark. Right. Same meaning. Totally different words. In raw token space, those sentences are miles apart mathematically. But VLJP maps them to nearby points in the semantic embedding space because they mean the same thing. It just dramatically simplifies the learning target. So how do they train this alignment efficiently? They use the bidirectional inference e loss. It's a contrastive learning method. It basically works by forcing the model to tell the difference between correct pairs, the video, and its correct language description, and negative pairs, so distractors from the match. Okay. And that contrastive mechanism inherently regularizes the embeddings. It pushes different concepts apart and prevents everything from just collapsing into one meaningless cluster. That's very clever. And the results show that all that pre-training on world dynamics really paid off. Oh, absolutely. VLJPA with the VJPA2 backbone hit state-of-the-art performance in the 8 billion parameter class on benchmarks like Perception Test and Temp Compass. And it did this even against models whose encoders were specifically trained with language supervision from the start. Which proves that a deep, robust understanding of the world's dynamics, even without language, is the best foundation. It seems to be. And the final success came from, you guessed it, scaling the alignment data from 18 million to almost 90 million samples. This has been a fascinating journey. We've seen the philosophical argument in iGPA, the massive scaling and efficiency in VGPA2 for video and robotics, and now VLJPA closing the loop with semantic language understanding. I think the key takeaway is just structural efficiency. This whole architecture successfully separates the predictable signal from the distracting, unpredictable noise. And that allows for faster training, better generalization, and the computational speed you need for real-time control.
So what does this progression mean for you, the listener, right now? Why should you care about this level of technical detail? You should care because these models are defining the architecture for the first generation of truly autonomous learning agents. This is the biggest step we've seen toward an AI that builds its own internal world model just by watching. That allows them to generalize and plan in new environments without needing explicit rewards or massive custom-built data sets for every single task. It shifts the whole bottleneck from data collection to architectural design. And that raises a final provocative thought that really links these two areas. Okay. Right now, VGP2AC, the robot, it relies on image goals. You showed a picture of the cleaned up table. Mm -hmm. But what happens when we fully integrate the sophisticated language capability of VLGP? Ah, that's the next frontier. Imagine a robot that can plan complex, multi-step actions, not from a visual target, mm -hmm. but from a single high-level natural language instruction. Mm -hmm. Go from, go pick up this specific cup to clean up the spill and the put all the utensils away. The goal state becomes an abstract linguistic concept, not a pixel map. Exactly. That level of generalization, especially as these models scale up towards 20 billion parameters. Yeah. That seems to be the inevitable and most exciting destination for these world models. The ability to define the goal in a high level semantic space, coupled with the computational efficiency of planning in an abstract space, that will unlock entirely new capabilities for AI agents. Thank you for diving deep with us today.